difficult nonlinear problems in various forms. He's legendary as a host and a cook. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I think he's going to explain. If you understood his mystical remarks about gradients and, and second derivatives being in L epsilon yesterday leading to C11, you're going to go on to C2 alpha today. All right. <laughs> Okay, so let me review a little bit the situation. We said uh, we studied equations uh, a i j d i j of u equal to zero with uh, no assumptions in a i j. No, no assumptions. On a i j except ellipticity. Except ellipticity. And we said that this is the same as, as uh, prescribing the fact that if you look at the square of u, at every point, the positive and the negative part are comparable. Okay. Uh, indeed, if you write the operator in the system of coordinates of the eigenfunctions, of the eigenvalues of this square of u, right, has the form sum of alpha j lambda j equal to zero, right, where all these alpha j's are strictly positive, and so this implies that the largest, the most <coughs> positive, and the most negative have to be comparable. Okay. The other way around, if you know that the largest, the most positive, and the most negative are comparable, right. So suppose you give me a u such that d squared of u plus is comparable to d squared of u minus, right? Then you can always cook up an alpha of x and a beta of x and say alpha of x times the sum of the lambda positives plus beta of x times the sum of the lambda negatives is equal to zero, right? All you have to do is divide by the sum of lambda. Alpha x is the sum of lambda. And these two numbers are comparable because this is what we are saying, right? And so you change coordinates and then you can write an equation in the standard system of coordinates, okay? So this equation, all it gives you is the information that d square plus and d square minus are comparable if you don't assume any regularity on the alphas, okay? So yesterday we proved Harnack inequality, and we proved it in, in two pieces, right? And I, so purposefully, I separated it in two pieces. The first piece said that uh, if u is a super solution, solution, And u of 0 is equal to 1, or less or equal than 1, right? Then we have control on the L epsilon norm of u. OK, was this decay of the? of the distribution function, this geometric decay of the distribution function. And if you think of harmonic functions, they're right in equality, right? Because if you have a super harmonic function, the value at the point controls the average. And then the second part says, if u bigger or equal than 0 in d1 is a subsolution, then the L epsilon norm controls the soup. Okay. And this again was a reasonable theorem if you think on subharmonic functions, the value at the point is controlled by the average. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I also didn't, so going back to my mumbling yesterday, which is uh, it's true, was just a mumbling, and I, 
uh, I didn't keep track of the first and second derivatives, but if you remember, when I look at this set D in the argument where gamma of u coincides with u, I say that on that set D, you have control on the function, the first derivatives, and one side control on the pure second derivatives, right? Because was where the convex envelope had a tangent plane, and so that gives you, for the graph of u, when you went back to u, that gave you a tangent quadratic polynomial, right? So on the u, we have control of u, gradient u, and the square of u. So uh, I won't, I didn't go through the details, but if you set the, this iterative theorem the right way, okay, then you can show not only that the sets where u is bigger than m to the k decays, but also the sets where gradient of u decays, and the set where d square of u is uh, bigger than something, you have a one side decay, okay? So I won't go through that, but automatically from this proof of uh, the Harnack inequality I gave yesterday, you get that these three things are in L epsilon. Okay. Okay. Now, so let's go back now to uniform elliptic equations. Zero, right? We say that ellipticity meant, okay, I normalize my equation f so that f of zero is equal to zero. This is equivalent for a linear equation to say that you have a zero right hand side, okay? And then ellipticity, we say that uniform ellipticity means that if you have f of m and you add a positive matrix, then the right-hand side increases proportional to the norm of m, right? Plus something of the order of norm of m. It's bounded above and below by the norm of n. And if you add a negative, so for a negative matrix, for a positive matrix, right? And if you add a negative matrix, the same. So an important observation I want to make, I mean a trivial but important for our theorem I want to make, is that if you are on the surface f of m equal to zero, if you are on the surface f of m equal to zero, right, and you are the positive matrix, and you want to go back to the surface, right? So you are on the surface f of m equal to zero, either positive matrix, so f becomes positive, right? A negative, I want to go back, these two have to be comparable, okay? In other words, if f of m and f of m plus n are both zero, then the n plus and the n minus have to be comparable, right? Because when you add the n plus, f increases proportionally to n plus, and then to go back to zero, you need to put something of the same order. Okay? So this is a very important remark I want to keep. Let me keep it here.
There is another important remark I need to record to use later, which is the following. It is, uh, so I want to turn upside down the first part of the Harnack inequality, the one that says if u is a super solution, u bigger or equal than 0, and u of 0 equal to 1, u belongs to L epsilon. Right. So let me turn this inequality upside down. So I said, suppose that V is a negative subsolution. Solution, right? And so I have here V. Into the picture here. So here I have zero. I have here a subsolution, <laughs> right? And suppose that the set where v is less than minus one is non-trivial. Okay. Then at the origin, b has to be away from zero. And V of 0 has to be smaller or equal than some constant times theta. Some, con some function of theta. So C of some constant, C of theta. Okay. Why is this? Okay, well, let me reduce it to this theorem. I flip the picture. I have the function which is very close to zero and has a non-trivial chunk at the level surface one, right? Now make me a dilation, I make this one. So I have to make, since this is very close to zero, I have to make a big dilation. I make this equal to one. But then this that is one, I'm kicking very far away, right? And I'm telling you that there is a chunk over here of size theta, right, where the function is bigger than this very large constant. And this certainly contradicts the L epsilon, right, because the L epsilon is control of the size at every level. Okay? So it is a consequence of this that if I have a subsolution and I have a piece where the subsolution is less than minus 1, then the subsolution near the origin separates from zero. Okay? It's like the De Georgi oscillation uh, lemma. V subsolution smaller or equal than zero. And the measure of the set where V is uh, less than minus 1 is equal to theta, v of 0 <laughs> less than const minus constant, depending on theta. So I need to put this two. And finally, I want to make a remark on renormalization. If you have a solution of a fully nonlinear equation, and you do lambda u of mu x, okay. If lambda is equal to min, uh, 1 over mu square, then this is a solution of exactly the same equation. Okay. If lambda is anything else, then this is a solution of another equation with exactly the same structural properties of f. It's a solution of a <coughs> dilation of the graph of f. 
right? Because I can write this as uh, lambda over mu square times mu square, right? This, the d square of this is the same as the old one. So all I'm doing is I'm multiplying the d square by a constant, right? Which places the point in the dilated surface. Okay? So it's a solution of an equation of the form f of lambda m equal to 0, but this lambda I can put outside. And if I do that, then all the properties, ellipticity, convexity, all the properties are preserved, right? Okay, if I do, if I have add here an n plus, you can get lambda n plus divided by lambda. So I have the same properties as before, okay? So I can renormalize, uh, if you guys have a solution of a fully nonlinear equation that is convex, let's say, I can uh, expand the domain multiplying by mu, and I can renormalize the height any way I want, and then it will be a solution of another equation with exactly the same structural conditions, okay? Okay, so now we also said a couple of days ago that if you have an equation f of d square of u equal to zero with the normalization f of zero equal to zero, right? Then if f of m is equal to zero, since f of zero is equal to zero here, let me put n, right? I can put in this observation m equal to 0, right? Because I'm assuming f of 0 equal to 0. And it follows from this observation then that any matrix that is solution of the equation satisfies that m plus and m, n plus and n minus are comparable. In other words, a solution of a fully nonlinear equation with this normalization is in particular a solution of an equation Aij. Yeah, j equal to zero. Okay. So the theorem, the Helder continuity applies, and therefore solutions of a fully nonlinear equation are Helder continuous, depending only on the infinity norm. <coughs> we also pointed out <laughs> that if you take a directional derivative. Then we have that fij of the square of u, dij of u alpha is equal to zero, right? And this hypothesis implies that this is a positive matrix. So this implies that the operator is uniformly elliptic, okay? So u alphas are solutions of an Aij equation. Okay. And as I said before, if you follow the proof, I, you know, this we will take for granted, but u alpha is automatically in an epsilon, right? So if you take u alpha plus, you get that is bounded. If you take u alpha minus, you get that is bounded. So solutions of an equation like this are Lipschitz. And further, when you know that u alpha is bounded, you apply the theorem and you know that u alpha is C beta. Okay. So in particular, solutions of an equation like this are C1 alpha. C1 beta. Okay. Further, we say that if F is concave, If f is concave, <coughs> I 
and you take any matrix M such that F of M is equal to zero, right? Then the differential at the O at M, right, is always bigger or equal than F of N at any other point. So if I do F I J of M. <coughs> F I J of M uh, <coughs> times uh, F I J of N times N I J or any other N N I J minus M I J, right? This is always. Uh, <coughs> this is always bigger or equal than f of n. Okay. So in particular, if I take a solution u, right? And I plug here M to be dij of U at a point, right? I have that Fij dij of U at Y, Fij, I'm sorry, Fij of <laughs> d square of U at X, right? I take M d square of U times dij of U at Y minus dij of u at x, right, nij minus mij, I'm sorry, here m, uh, n, yeah, it's always bigger or equal than f of the square of u at y. But if u is a solution of the equation, that is zero. So if I take y equal x plus h e and y equal x minus h e, right? And I add up, I build up the second order incremental quotient, right? I have that f i j of the square of u at x times the second order incremental quotient, u at x plus h e plus u at x minus h e minus two times u at x, right? This is bigger or equal than zero. So second derivatives, pure second derivatives, are always subsolutions of an equation with bounded measurable coefficient. And so in particular for pure second derivatives, this remark applies. If I, I can always abstract a constant, right? And so if they are less than some constant in a chunk, they separate from their maximum, OK? OK, so now let's prove that solutions So OK, by the way, then pure second derivatives are subsolutions. Right? And they are in L epsilon. Right? This was the other general fact for solutions of Aij. So, <coughs> they are in L epsilon. So, the second theorem said if you have <coughs> a subsolution which is positive and in L epsilon, 
it is bounded. So the alpha, alpha plus are all bounded. But since the positive part and the negative part of the Hessian of u are comparable at every point, because u has a solution of an equation with bounded measurable coefficient, that means that the alpha alpha minus is also bounded. Okay. So we are at the point where we know we have a solution. So now the hypothesis of our theorem is theorem. Suppose that U is a C11 solution of F of the square of U equal to zero in B1, one, F uniformly elliptic and concave. Okay. Right. So these are hypotheses now because we have proven that they are true for any bounded solution U. Then U is C Okay, so the proof is going to be an oscillation lemma. So here I have the unit ball of Rn. This is the x variable. OK. And I take the Hessian map, in other words, the d square of u into the space of matrices. So I have here the Hessian map. So I have here the d squares of u of x which are matrices, OK? And u is C11, so I can assume that the diameter of that set is, let's say, uh, 1. Okay. I, say, I say I can renormalize u any way I want. In particular, I can always multiply by a constant to make the second derivatives equal, less or equal than 1, the diameter exactly 1. So I have here the diameter is 1. Then I say, all I have to prove to you is that if I reduce the ball a number of times, that is that for some smaller ball, universal smaller ball, B are 0, right? the diameter falls below 1 half. OK, so prove will show that for some BR0, diameter of the Hessian falls zero in the image they are falls below one half. Okay. If I do that, I can renormalize always to so whatever I have left, whatever the diameter is. I can renormalize the u at the ball of radius 1. I can renormalize the diameter to be 1 again, multiplying u by a factor, repeat the argument, and then I will have a geometric decay on the diameter of u in the balls of radius r0 to the k. So this is all I have to prove. Okay? <coughs> 
Okay, so I'm going to do the following. I'm going to cover the image by, I'm going to do two coverings of the image by non-overlapping balls. One is going to be by balls of radius delta and another epsilon. And I'm going to choose both along the proof, okay? Delta is going to be small, epsilon is going to be much smaller. Okay. <coughs> so let me cover this image has diameter one, so it's con contained in a cube of size one in Rn by n. So I do a covering by balls Bj of radius delta and points xj uh, mj right, in the space of matrices. And I do another covering by balls, bk of radius epsilon. Okay. I need the delta to the minus n by n of these, right? Doesn't matter, some negative power of delta. And I need, <coughs> it's, it's here. Okay. okay, let me do the pictures there and the notation here. So I have the covering B delta J of MJ and B epsilon K of MK. This I need delta to the minus n times n, and this I need epsilon to the minus k squared. Okay? So, the, so now I look at the inverse images of the balls of radius delta. Okay? So these are h minus 1 of bj delta. Okay. And they cover the unit ball. So there is one that covers here a set of measure delta to the n squared. Okay. So there is one, they cannot all be too tiny. One of them, let's call it B1 delta here, such that the inverse image has measure bigger than delta to the n squared. Okay? Because they are n squared delta to the minus n squared of them. So one has to have this measure. Okay. So this ball has its center in some matrix here in the image, right? This ball has so center in some matrix MJ. Okay. M1, because well I already call M1 this. So. Say the ball B3, M3. Okay. Okay, so, so this ball here, the, so here I have this ball, right, whose inverse image has non trivial measure, right, and, um, and it's centered here. Now, since the set has diameter, I'm going to use that the set not that has diameter 1, I'm going to use that the set has diameter bigger than 1 half. Okay, because I want to repeat this argument many times, even if the diameter falls below one, but as long as the diameter stays above one half. So since the diameter is bigger than one half, right, there is another m, in this case let's say m1, such that this distance is bigger than one four. Okay? Because the diameter is bigger than one half, than one half, so one of the two points have to have distance to this one bigger than one fourth. So 
So let's recapitulate. I choose B3 of M3 delta such that H minus 1 of B3, right, has non-trivial measure. OK. And since the image has diameter bigger, since diameter Let me call H the image. Diameter of H is bigger or equal than 1 half. There exists, let's say, M, M, such that the norm of M minus M3 is bigger than 1 fourth. OK? But these two m's are in the image. They are d squares of u, right? This is at some point x3. This is uh, x1. This is at some point x3. OK? And therefore, according to this remark, both the positive and negative part of this difference is of order 1 fourth, because they lie on the surface of ellipticity. And matrices on the surface of ellipticity have the positive and negative part of the difference comparable to the norm. Okay? So that means that there is a pure second derivative in M which is bigger than the pure second derivative in M3 plus something of order 1 fourth. OK? So this implies that there exists an alpha such that the alpha alpha of u in M is bigger or equal than the alpha alpha of u in, I mean, uh, in, X, uh, in uh, X1 is bigger or equal than the alpha alpha of u in X3, which was the center of this ball, right? Plus something of order 1, OK? Let's say 1 over 100, OK? So now I choose delta. If I choose delta small enough, right, I can say this inequality not only with x3, but with any other point in this little ball. OK? Because the matrix in the little ball, this matrix changes by at most delta, so the eigenvalues change by at most delta. OK? So if delta is a small, I can say the alpha alpha of u of x1 is bigger or equal than the alpha alpha u of x plus 1 over 200 for any x, for any m in the ball that is here, for any x in the inverse image. In B3. OK? And this is less than the soup of the alpha alpha of U in B1, right? This is one of them. So let's call this soup T. Okay. So recapitulating, I have that I can find a pure second derivative, which in this ball, right, is less than the soup on the image minus a fixed chunk. 
okay, at any point on the ball. Then I want to apply this observation to d alpha alpha of u minus t. So apply observation to d alpha alpha of u minus t. d alpha alpha of u minus t, right, is <coughs> a subsolution, okay, is negative because t was the soup, non positive. <coughs> and the alpha alpha of u minus t, right, is less or equal than minus 1 over 200. Right, I pass the t on this side and I pass the 1 over 200 on the other, right, for the inverse image of Vm3, right, on h minus 1 of Vm3. <coughs> But Vm3 has non-trivial measure, delta to the n squared. By now, delta is fixed. It's 1 over 10 million, right? So it's a completely fixed number. A domain of size delta to the n squared. So this lemma tells me that in the ball of radius 1 half, the alpha alpha of u minus t is less than a universal constant that depends only on delta, which is fixed. This set of delta is going to be my epsilon, my two epsilon, let's say. Okay. So now I look in the image I look to the cover by balls of size epsilon. So it's some ball that was covering the soup. Let's assume the soup is attained, right? So there is some ball that covers the soup, okay? But this is a ball of radius epsilon. So if I go to the ball, the soup of the alpha alpha, right? If I go to the ball of radius one half, now, and I look at the image by the ball of radius one half, right? To cover it, I don't need to use that ball anymore. Because in the ball of radius 1 half, the alpha alpha is always less than the soup minus 2 epsilon, sorry. Minus 2 epsilon, right? So of this covering by balls of radius epsilon, there is one that I can throw away. I say, in the ball of radius 1 half, the alpha alpha of u is less than the old soup minus 2 epsilon. 
I apply this lemma, right? The alpha alpha of u is less or equal than the old soup minus 2 epsilon, right? So if I take the point where the old soup was attained, right, then in the ball of radius 1 half, there is nothing close to it. Because all the d squared satisfies that this is less than the old soup minus 2 epsilon. OK? So of the covering of my balls of radius epsilon, I can throw away one. The one that contained the point, let's suppose the soup is attained, if not you do, that contained the soup. OK? So I just throw one ball. And I renormalize. If the diameter falls below one half, I'm done. If it didn't, I can repeat this argument, and I throw away another ball of radius epsilon. OK? And I can do this again and again and again. And after a finite number of steps, my set disappears, because I have thrown the whole covering of the set. OK? So this is impossible. It means that after a finite number of steps, the diameter of the image has to fall below 1 half. OK? So let me write that. <coughs> so this implies to cover H of B one half with the family B epsilon K of M K, right? I need one less. And remember, I made the argument using the diameter was bigger than 1 half, not that it was 1. So now I said we can renormalize keeping the d squared the same, right? So we renormalize keeping the same d squared. So we do, we are in the ball of radius 1 half, we do u of, uh, u of x over 2 times 4. So we renormalize, renormalize right? And this maps the ball of radius 1 half to the ball of radius 1, and the d squared stays exactly the same. So the image is whatever is left of the old image, right? The image has not changed. I mean, it's smaller because it's only the image of b 1 half, but has not changed, OK? has the same old covering, so I keep the same old covering of balls of radius epsilon, right? But the difference is that now this is slightly smaller, the image, and I have thrown away one ball, OK? And, OK, I have the alternative. If diameter of H of B1 half which is now is the now is the age of B1 in the new renormalization, but it's slightly smaller. It's less than one half, I'm done. If not, I repeat the argument. And I can throw another ball of the covering mod balls of radius epsilon. If not, repeat and And I keep repeating if I renormalize again, and if can throw away another ball, and I can renormalize again, I can throw away another ball, right? And the number of balls depends on delta, which was some fixed number, and so on. So after a finite number of steps, right, I get rid of all the image, right? So after a finite number of steps, If diameter never goes below one half, 
have the image disappears. And this is a contradiction. Okay. Okay, so this completes the proof because it's this says that the oscillation of the image decreases geometrically. Uh, and so after, a f you know, after when you iterate, you get the Helder continuity. Okay, I guess we'll stop that. Thank you.